virus. So anyway, thank you all for joining. We appreciate you joining during uh, Zoom. Please know that we are being recorded because this is a public meeting. So, um, <clears throat> so I just wanna alert you to that. Uh, Casey, do we have a quorum? Uh, yes, Judge, we do. All right, so uh, with that, do you need to do a roll call, Casey, on who's on the phone, or do you have that listed? Uh, no, I have the listing in Zoom. So if I okay. if I see you here, then uh, you're good to go. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I want to thank uh, Justice Boyd for joining us and uh, appreciate everyone on the call. Thank you uh, very much for taking the time. Uh, we're going to start with an e-file Research Texas guide and file update, and it's probably going to be pretty extensive. Uh, so uh, bear with us. So Casey, do you want to? Yep. So we've got on the call with us, Terry Derrick with uh, Tyler Technologies, as well as uh, I believe Evan's on the, the uh, uh, Zoom call as well. And so Terry, I believe I've got it set to where, let me make sure. Yeah. Uh, where you can share your screen. So I will kick it over to you, Terry, and let you get started. Thanks, Casey. Hey, Casey, would it be possible to allow Evan to share his screen? Yep, uh, y'all both can. Okay, great. Uh, Evan, if you'll throw the slide up, that would be, that would be great. <clears throat> All right, well, it's good to be here, everyone, even if, if it has to be virtually, uh, it's good to see everybody on the, on the screen again. Uh, we're gonna start by just providing a quick update on eFile Texas, uh, where, the, where the program is right now. Uh, and then I'm gonna pass it over to Evan and let him speak a little bit about some of the initiatives that we're doing with the, the new eFile Texas uh, contract and the project around that, as well as um, the new review tool that we're implementing. And so Evan, if you'll go to the first slide. <clears throat> So uh, looking over the last few months, we've, we've seen the program continue to move in the right direction. Um, we see you know, over 480,000 registered users in the, in the system. So we're approaching the half million mark, which is pretty neat to see. We're, we're processing about 38,000 envelopes per day. And you'll see, <clears throat> as you look at the graph here, a noticeable dip on 622. And so that dip right there uh, is followed immediately by a spike. And so there was an incident that occurred on 622 with a stored procedure that was implemented uh, that was written by Microsoft. And so when we introduced our 2020.0.04 uh, version of our system, it included that uh, stored procedure that Microsoft had written. And it, what, it, what it resulted in is a numerous calls into the database and resulted in it just over over flooding the database with uh, with calls per transaction. So uh, the way that we resolved that is we actually took that stored procedure out and replaced it with one that we were custom wrote for eFile Texas to make it more commensurate with our needs for the program. And, and that resolved the issue. Uh, I think the interesting thing is, is that <clears throat> the process and the policies that we put in place, those procedures to, to rectify situations is illustrated by that. And you can actually see it on the chart here where you see the filing volume on 622 go in half of what our, what our average was for the month. But then that following day, it picked back up. So filings that were, were missed on that, on that day on the 22nd were recovered on the 23rd. Uh, which, is a, which is a good sign that we can react on a program this size and this magnitude uh, in such a short order and get the program right back on track when we encounter a, a significant issue like we did on the 22nd. Um, all in all, though, it feels like we're moving in the right direction, specifically as it pertains to the volume of cases as well as the volume of filings that we're seeing uh, now as they're approaching and, and are commensurate with pre-pandemic levels. So Evan, if you'll click to the next slide, We'll show you an illustration of that. <clears throat> and so the case volume is, is represented uh, in, in these columns here. The green is a representation of what our pre-pandemic case volumes were. And so you can see that we're actually right where we need to be in terms of that case volume. And so uh, if you look at a July on July comparison of the case volume, we're a little lower in July, but not by much, only by a few hundred um, cases. But if you look at the filing comparison, 
the filing comparison actually shows a 16% growth. So we're, we're, we're processing more filings this year in July uh, than we did in July of last year. So uh, really good to see that the program is, is, is still maintaining its, its, uh, its position and continuing to, to serve the needs of the user communities despite uh, the ups and downs that we're experiencing through the pandemic. What will be interesting to see is, is with this, this latest um, surge with, uh, with the pandemic, if there's going to have any, if there will have any impact on the case filing volume or in any, any filing volume in general uh, as, we, as we move into the latter part of the year. So we'll continue to monitor that and then, and then provide an update to this group accordingly. All right, Evan, if you want to go to the next slide. <clears throat> Uh, redaction is actually also approaching the half million mark. So we're just shy of it, about 435,000 uh, utilizations. We're averaging about 14,000 uh, utilizations to about 15,000 utilizations a month. Uh, and we still have three EFSPs that have implemented and made available the service. So we'll continue to watch this as we continue to move on, um, but it feels like it's, it's still moving in the right direction as well. Evan, you go to the next slide. So, can I ask you one question about this slide, if you'll go back, Evan, is that okay? Yeah, so the service is implemented and available within three EFSPs, so you have those three. So R, is the redaction tool usage based on those three EFSPs, or are they using it outside of that, or tell me a little bit more about that. Right. So these are the three EFSPs that have chosen to implement the service. It's available for every EFSP to implement at their discretion. So if they want to implement it within their respective portal, they can. If they don't want to, they don't have to. And so these are the three that have chosen to do this. So the utilizations are whether it comes through the eFile Texas filing portal or whether it comes through the, the commercial providers like FileTime or ProDoc. Okay. So, so if I'm a lawyer and I'm filing and I don't use one of these three EFSPs, then it's not readily available to me to do the that's, redaction. That's, that's correct. They can still use other redaction solutions that are outside <laughs> of the, the redaction service provided within eFile Texas. Um, they can even do the old, old school Sharpie marker um, method sure. or use one of the other providers, but it, they, they wouldn't be able to use the one provided within the eFile Texas program unless they use one of these three EFSPs. So what is the barrier to the implementation of this service within the other EFSPs? You know, it's, it's really just based upon personal preference and, and prioritization with those EFSPs and the value that they deem it uh, to, to possess on whether or not they choose to implement it. Um, it could be investment strategies. It could be um, just the, the perceived value versus other values that they may be bringing to the table. Um, and, just could be a and, number of things that varies by EFSP. Terry, to add some color around it, keep in mind too that some of our EFSPs have more of a niche market, like you know the line bargers that do the direct filing with the tax suits. They won't necessarily need any kind of redaction, so they may not implement it. Um, you know the EFSP that is doing returns of service electronically and, and effectuating service. They may not need it. So I, I, I agree. It may be just part of whatever that EFSP strategy is uh, for implementing to do it. So, so as far as we know, there's no technical barrier. Or no. Uh -uh. Is there a financial barrier? Is there? Not, is this no. It, is this? The only cost that they would pay is, is whatever their natural cost to pay a programmer to implement it. Okay. So just to integrate, to implement the program. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Sure. Hey, Terry, I'm sorry. This is uh, John Warren. If you can go back to your, well, you don't have to go back to the, uh, the as it relates to the foulings for uh, uh, July. <clears throat> can you, can we look at what, can you, or do you know off the top of your head what the filing numbers were for uh, uh, pre COVID and 2019? You, you said we were, we were kind of back on track, but, but you know, d during the summer periods, uh, that's kind of everyone's vacation time. So numbers kind of go down. Uh, sure. but, uh, but I would like to see just what 19 was as compared to uh, where we are at this past summer. 
Yeah, I, John, I don't have that in front of me, but I can I can speak to it here. Um, I'll pull that pull that information up while Evan is going through the rest, and I can I can share that okay. with you. Okay. I've got it. I've got it. I've got it readily available. I just need to go grab it. Okay. <clears throat> All right, to so talk just briefly about um, our Justice of the Peace um, implementations, we've got 165 precincts across 42 counties that are live with seven active engagements and three that are pending. For those three that are pending, we're likely going to, uh, to, to postpone some of those uh, until after the implementation of Senate Bill 41. Um, we'll be speaking a little bit of, uh, more about that later today, um, about some of the processes that we'll be implementing and how that schedule will look as we get closer to the implementation date of, of January 1. Right now, the JPs contribute more than 100,000 filings per, per month. So uh, it's, it's still in a good spot, but I, I think we're, we're reaching the point where um, adoption is gonna be dependent upon um, any future mandate or, or encouragement of, of implementing this, the solution. I think those JP precincts that have wanted to get on board, I think, um, have at this point, and I think we're starting to see a slowdown in adoption of, of JPs. <clears throat> All right, Evan, hey, if you go one more, Terry, if I may, how many of those are in Dallas County? Of that, uh, four, of those forty-two, I I don't know that off the top of my head, John, but I can I can pull that up. Okay. Can I also ask, with regard to the counties that are green? Are you experiencing some JPs in those counties that are not doing it, or is every JP in those counties doing it? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah, it, not all precincts inside of those counties are, are opting in. It's usually done by a precinct by precinct basis. Some are more um, uh, motivated to implement it where others are not. And so um, you, you do see um, you know, certain counties that have a higher level of, of participation amongst their precincts, whereas you have others that just one precinct would be interested in implementing it. And so we, we, we work with that one precinct to get them on. So do, we have, that. do you have a program or some type of system that goes out and tells the other precincts in those counties uh, how good your, the system is and why they should join in? Yeah, we, we, we share information with them, but a lot of it is driven off of our informational website with efiletexas.gov. We don't have a, uh, an uh, active marketing, aggressive marketing campaign where we're going out. We can certainly, um, you know, push for more precincts and, and, um, and encourage those to, to jump on board. But right now we're not aggressively marketing to those precincts. It's really just a, we, we do have a service. It is available for free to implement if you choose to do that. And we'd be happy to help you if that's the decision that you'd like to make. Thank you. <clears throat> sure. Okay. All right. Next slide, Evan, please. All right. Just a quick update on Research Texas. And I believe I, I didn't put some information in here that I do need to, uh, to share with you, but I'll, I'll, uh, hopefully circle back after uh, the presentation and, and share that with you. Um, I think Justice Simmons, you had some uh, requests for some information that I'm still working on, on pulling out. So I'll, uh, I'll try, try to see if I can't get that before the end of the meeting. Uh, with regards to our user adoption increases, uh, we've seen about 21% increase over the last four months. Um, it looks about the 12,000 users that have been uh, added mostly in the registered users category. Uh, registered users is kind of a, um, could be a, a little misleading um, because that also represents legal professionals who are not attorneys. So legal assistants, paralegals, things like that. Um, those types of roles would be included in that registered users. And we believe that's who's really um, using the system and taking advantage of it. They've, the, the three feedback uh, loops, so really the first two is, has been fairly consistent with regards to criminal data and judgments and orders. The third one is actually starting to surface quite a bit now, uh, which is around hearing data. They're asking about that. Hearing data is available and can make it available inside of research. That would help, I think, improve the quality of that service and the value of that offering. However, it is dependent upon the uh, integrations of those case management systems. So if they're not integrated, we obviously can't share that information. 
So they need to be integrated and then be able to then leverage the APIs that are provided to exchange that information and make it available to those users. So Terry, tell me what kind of, like, sorry, tell me when, when they say hearing data, what kind of data are we talking about? Just wanting to know about um, upcoming hearings as well as okay. historical that hearings on the case. So it can, yeah, so just if, if I'm on a case being able to do that, one of the values that it does bring to, um, to the users is if they are practicing in multiple jurisdictions, it, it'll allow for the attorneys to be able to pull up essentially a comprehensive hearing schedule if we can get those counties all integrated and sharing that information. So. Um, you know, a lot of times they'll use Outlook or, or use some other tool in order to, to manage that. But to be able to have that information available to them inside of research and look at a comprehensive hearing docket for what they've got upcoming, I think would be a real value add to those attorneys. All right. Um, and I just got a note uh, from... Um, <clears throat> from uh, one of the Tyler representatives that's on the, the call. John, going back to your uh, question, Dallas County JP Precinct 2, Place 2, and Dallas County JP Precinct 4, Place 1 are the two that are currently live. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And Evan, I think I'm going to uh, pass it over to you to talk about the review tool update. All right. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Uh, I assume this may be a, a pretty interesting topic for some. Um, so I want to start with the review tool update. So as you know, uh, if you haven't heard, oops, we will actually be, uh, Microsoft will be deprecating uh, Silverlight support on 1012. Um, but ahead of that deprecation, um, and in partnering with the OCA and finding a, a good balance between um, the features that will be available that will continue to roll out and then having enough breathing room between um, when we decide to migrate users over and the deprecation date, we've chosen the evening of 10 three to uh, implement what we call Silverlight redirects. So what will happen on that date is uh, any re reviewers will be provided the alternate URL um, that will be the new review tool going forward to log into. Filers that attempt to hit the Silverlight tool will actually be redirected to our new EFSP application. Um, so um, before we do that, we actually have a, a, pretty, a pretty lengthy acclimation period where we recommend that um, users, uh, court users actually begin using the tool in earnest uh, as much as possible between now and that 10-3 uh, deprecation date. Uh, in that acclimation period, um, we will be, uh, we'll be able to update more of the training content during that time as new features are rolled out. Um, it, it'll be a, a, good, a good exercise for us to be able to flesh out any, any bugs in the tool that may, um, that may actually uh, crop up. Because uh, with anything with software, nothing's launched and nothing worked perfectly on day one. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good um, dress rehearsal, if you will, uh, before we actually hit that migration date. Uh, and then um, before that date, we've actually, or, you know, prior to us uh, going, essentially going live on 811, which was consistent of us sending out the eye contact to all production users or all production clerk users uh, uh, that we currently have registered, we provided a, a solution validation, solution orientation uh, webinars, which we actually have recordings to and are available uh, upon request that we can send to counties. Um, additionally, we've, uh, if you've been to the reviewer section of the eFile Texas page recently, you'll notice that we've actually, we've gone ahead and updated the, the portal login page that will now redirect clerks to the, the new tool, which is the desired, uh, result going forward. And we've also updated the page with the most up-to-date, uh, training videos, uh, for the new review tool. So Evan, just to make sure I understand what deprecate means in this context we're talking mm -hmm. about silver light will no longer be supported is that correct. correct okay that's correct all right well i i know for our county we can't even get the new site to work so do you know when the new site is going to actually start working so we can test 
Uh, it should be working uh, currently. Have you had a chance to reach out to our support team? I do know I, that Internet I, Explorer. I did. Not- I put in a ticket and they answered this morning saying they turned it into the dev team. Okay. If you like, I'd like to, if you could send me that ticket number um, outside of this, I'd like to, I'd like to get uh, some attention on that one. I put it, I'll put it in the chat. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. We we have had several uh, courts already go through and and start using the system, review it in production, um, have them accept it and actually process through just fine. Um, So if you're having some trouble, let's, let's take that offline, dig into it because it's likely something that we can help with. Yeah, Terry, we messed around with it yesterday, and we didn't we didn't have any issues here in Hidalgo. Oh, that's great to hear. Thanks, Laura. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, and I think it's due to the size of the amount of envelopes in our system. Cool. And this is the Thanks. exact reason why we're implementing this way is to try to uncover those issues before we get to the October time period. So if there are any any issues like that that we can resolve now while we still have the safety net and a silver light, that's a, that's a great opportunity for us to, to fix those and get them done uh, well ahead of that deprecation or decommissioning of those silver light servers. That's right. Any other Evan, question? Just, Evan, just to clarify and making sure everybody is aware that both the old the current Silverlight tool and the new non-Silverlight tool are both available and you can interchange between the two. So if, if there's a group like Tracy who tries it and it's really not working for them, they can still go back to the Silverlight one and, you know, interchange with that, even to the point of where if you have a team of, you know, say 10 deputy clerks and two of them, can switch while the other eight are still on the old one and you can do that kind of planning and flipping back and forth rather than a, a hard cut. That is true, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. But that is just until October 12th, right? Until October the 3rd, in which case then it will everybody will cut over to the new one. The old one will go away. Correct. Okay. Any other questions on the review tool implementation update? Okay, Uh, changing gears to our eFile 2.0 project update. So um, actually as of June 30th, we turned in uh, the analysis and design documents or the conceptual design documents to the OCA and they're accepted. So that actually uh, officially completed our analysis and design phase. We're currently underway with our our development as we speak. That actually began on um, July 12th. Um, Just a reminder, some of the things are gonna be included in the cycle one development are the bulk review actions. So Tracy, I believe that's one that you're a very big proponent of. That is where you can select multiple filings at once and take a single action on those filings. So that way you don't have to click accept, click accept, click accept. You can just take one swift action and get those all out of your queue. Um, More enhanced reviewer activity logging. So in the new review tool, we will be able to surface some of the review history and some of the action history reviewers are taking in a, a, a live view versus having to wait on that reviewer operations report. So the new uh, activity logging will be uh, driven, will be driving that uh, the data that's surfaced in the review tool. And there will be uh, more enhancements to the, the current data set that we um, publish out to eFiling Insights, which I do have a an update on that one next. Um, and lastly, uh, the big piece of the cycle one development is, is where a lot of our focus and energy is, is right now is uh, ECF 5.0. And one thing to note uh, with ECF 5.0, when we do deploy uh, to production, which right now is uh, estimated around May 20, 2022, we will be putting ECF 4.0 uh, into a maintenance mode, which means we, won't, we will not be developing any new features against ECF uh, 4.0. It'll essentially go into a break fix mode where, you know, if anything breaks, of course, we will we will fix it, but no new development will go against it. Um, and the current tentative timeline is one year after that. So estimated May 2023, we'll actually be fully deprecating support for ECF 4.0. What that looks like, it's still something we are, we're, um, we're still exploring whether that's just us removing the endpoints, it becomes an unsupported service. Um, 
However, the EFM team will be will be uh, providing more details around that, uh, and they will be discussing more next steps uh, in those uh, EFM compass checks. So if it does impact you, I would strongly encourage you to make sure to attend some of the upcoming compass checks to get more information on that. Uh, so a quick little update on the e-filing insights. Uh, our e our um, pilot group for e-filing insights actually begins uh, in Q in uh, August uh, to mid September. What we're going to be doing is incorporating incorporating suggestions from our pilot group, getting some of that feedback and general availability for the clerk the clerk user base um, will be available by uh, end of year. Excuse me. And. Uh, that a lot of the, the features that we're putting in the uh, data set will actually be uh, uh, included with the cycle one uh, development. So we'll have general adoption this year, which means you'll have access to the data set as it currently stands. And then with the cycle one developments, we will be pushing out more data elements for you to be able to um, pivot and analyze using the new tool. Uh, next, the automatic certificate of service uh, update. So um, we've had some success with uh, the appellate courts, the Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals on the automated, uh, the automatic certificate of service. And just as a reminder, um, it's uh, if you look on the right hand side of this, of this slide uh, is a, a sample of what that actually is, if you've forgotten, but essentially it's the fight, it's a additional page that's appended to the end of a, a of the document that indicates uh, what case of contacts and what service contacts are actually served as part of that filing. Um, so here uh, on the left-hand side is a, a high level of the rollout schedule that we're gonna be doing. Um, so the first week we're gonna, we're gonna take uh, the first half of the top 10 and a little later in the week, we're gonna take the second half of the top 10. And that's basically just to make sure that adding that additional process to that number of filings and to that amount of volume is gonna do anything to upset the system. We don't think it will, but again, just as another safety measure. And once we get past that hurdle, um, the second the second week we'll be implementing the remaining 244 counties uh, in thirds. And there will be there's a more detailed list of when your county will be included in that rollout that's going to be sent out via eye contact and will also be available on our eFile Texas informational site. Any questions? Well, I have tons, but uh have have any has anyone seen how much of an increase this does to the documents and how much more time per document because even at our rate of our filings that we get per day we still don't have a timely manner that the filings come down and that's without this process so i don't know what y'all have been doing as far as figuring out how much longer each envelope takes to get to the CMS. Um, but I have a real problem with this process and it affecting our staff because as per our lawsuit, we have to have these filings in. Every, fi every new suit that we get per day has to be in our system before our clerks leave. And at this time, our clerks are staying as long as 6 p.m., sometimes 6.30 waiting on envelopes to get there so they can get them processed. But, uh, Tracy, isn't, isn't that kind of like an unusual request? Because if um, the county's hours are, in this instance, Harris County is eight to five and a lawyer may work and, and if you can file any time and a lawyer files at six o'clock. I mean, uh, how is how is how I'm talking is, about they're staying to six o'clock to get the uh, envelopes filed by 430 in the system. Oh, okay. So, sorry, go ahead, Casey. I was just going to say, you had mentioned the appellate courts, but I know, Evan, that we have a laundry list of district courts from other counties, yeah. big and small, all, all, all over the board, and I don't believe we've gotten any kind of negative feedback from them. I mean, the, the feedback that I've been getting is from judges and attorneys talking about um, those the the benefits of it generally yeah so that's correct casey we do there is a, a smattering of other counties that actually do have this implemented i i do have the list pulled up off to the side um but 
yeah, you're right. It is, it is um, various counties of different sizes, different integration types. As far as the individual document size that gets added onto the end, I'm not sure what the, the actual data size is, but since it's typically a single page. So I'm, I, I'm venturing a guess it's relatively low as far as processing times between before enabling and after enabling. Um, I can check with our environmental team and see if they can do any kind of analysis to see if it did add any kind of measurable difference in the integration, but um, echoing what Casey said, we haven't, we haven't had anything um, come out of support where um, a county that enabled it saw a, a dramatic increase in the amount of time it took for filings to process. But that is some information that we can look up for you, Tracy, because I do know your, your filing volume is, is um, exponentially greater than some of the other counties that are participating. Exactly. And we, we kind of did a little study on our side already. Uh, once we heard this got mandated, uh, kind of an unfunded mandate as far as I'm concerned, because it is going to increase our sand space. Um, we're going through a four terabyte LUN every uh, six to eight months at this point, and don't know how much that's going to increase that. We also uh, are getting about about 3,500 filings a day, which uh, equals about 5,500 lead documents, which is what this is affecting is the lead document. And out of those 5,500 times that you're adding this page per day, we can see a significant slowdown on our side when this happening. Okay, so yeah, let me, let me take that offline. Uh, to our environmental team and see if there's if if it's if it's something that they can tell it's if it's specific to this integration type or if it's something within the system. And I guess questions on the state side. I mean, how is it? I, I guess legally, how is it that they were able to alter the attorney's original filing? I don't understand that either. Okay, Tracy, how do you mean alter the attorney's original filing? Well, so if an attorney files a lead document, asks for e-service, it's only one page. When it gets to our CMS and what we file ends up being two pages, it's not what the attorney filed because they added this page to the end. And now a customer, when they ask for a certified copy of that, they're now going to pay $2 for it instead of a dollar, which is what the attorney filed. So... So you're saying just adding this, okay, so your concern is about adding the automated certificate of service is alters what the attorney did? Right. I mean, anytime you go in and you mess with a document, adding a page, so forth, whether it's uh, to a PDF, you could potentially corrupt something else in the document. We've already had problems with our error queue and just for uh, Tyler to add the file stamp to the top of the document sometimes corrupts that document, ends up in our error queue. We have to return that to the filer. But now you're adding a page to every single lead document that's asked for e-service. I mean, that's a, that could be significant. Tracy, can you identify uh, specifically some of those in the event I need to be aware of um, uh, Dallas County's processes? Um, I'll turn to Evan. He, I've seen the list recently, but I can look for it. Yeah, let me, I can, I can pull up that list here in just a moment. Todd and Nancy has their hand raised. Just Yeah, Todd, Todd and Nancy do have their uh, hands raised. I, I did raise my hand. Uh, I'll add to that. Uh, something that maybe in the long term is going to alleviate any issue with increasing file size is, you know, I think eventually we will see a rule change that will do away with the uh, formal certificate of service requirement, because the idea of course here is to, is to automate processes that ought to be automated where we don't need to have uh, a human, you know, attesting that I, I sent this to, so and so attorney, when the system you know provides us with that documentation, and so over the longer haul, um, I would expect that the Supreme Court Advisory Committee will change the rules such that a, a certificate of service, which sometimes takes up an entire page, 
uh, in a document, if you've got a lengthy uh, list of lawyers who are being served, um, will be removed. And so that that's not going to happen next month. Uh, it may not even happen next year. But I think in terms of the long term uh, effect on the system, as far as file size, I think it's going to be a wash. Um, that's one thing to, to factor in. And I, I think Tracy already answered some, some of this question, but as far as altering the nature of documents, it's really not to me any different than a file stamp. Uh, yeah, it, ha it happens on a different page, but it's, it's actually far better documentation of what actually occurred uh, than a certificate of, of service that a lawyer or, in, in fact, most of the time a staff person is going to complete and you know we've we've heard story after story about how lawyers who have said oh i never got that judge and in the face of, of one of these automated certificates of e-service uh, their argument to that point is just uh is destroyed and so as a practicing lawyer you know I, i've always been in favor of automation and the, in the smart use of technology where we can get it. This takes a lot of guesswork and temptation out of the process of serving documents. And so uh, I think it's a, it's a fantastic move forward. And um, I, I take it that the Supreme court has said, this is happening. I mean, we've got a rollout schedule here to the extent there are you know legitimate issues with it as far as file size and so forth. You know, maybe there is a way um, Evan, that Tyler can, can deal with this to make it more efficient, but, um, just, it's still such a big gain, I think, in terms of efficiency for the, for all of the practicing lawyers in Texas and for the courts as well, that, um, can, it really can, is, a, can a lawyer go on to eFile Texas, go to their envelope, print this page out, take it to court with him at any point in time, if that's going to be, uh, contested? Well, sometimes you don't know if it's going to be contested until you actually get to court. Um, you know, I I don't know. I, mean, I guess can, I don't understand your question, Tracy, because I mean, they can pull what, that up on your it, phone or they can print it. I mean, in a point in time, if it's contested, they the, the lawyer can show that without this uh, automated service added to it. I mean, they've always had the ability on EFAL Texas to go in to their envelope and see who got served and who didn't. And they can prove that up at any mm -hmm. point in time in, in the court of law. They could. Uh, I, I understand what you're saying now. I just, this is, this would remove, I think, any temptation by any lawyer to say, I didn't get something when their email address is listed in the automated certificate. And then eventually, you know, you're not going to rely on the lawyers to say, I serve so-and-so. This is, this is why we have an e-filing system with the capabilities that, that it has. And I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say, Tracy, that there's not some administrative issue with it. I don't know. I've, I've heard what you said. And um, I think ultimately, as I said, the, the, the additional data side of it, is, it would be remedied long term. Uh, if it's if one adding one page to a document is adding significant storage issues, I'd be a little surprised, especially with it being just a, a text page and not, you know, video or anything like that uh, or images. But you know, I'll leave that to the to Evan and the folks at Tyler to respond to, and I certainly you know encourage them to look into this and see what can be done to to make it faster. Uh, can I say something, Justice Simmons? Sure. Yeah, just to echo what Mr. Smith is saying, uh, you don't know all the time when someone's going to say, "I didn't get this," and you know, I've been on both sides of the the bench, and uh, having this in the court's file to where the court can look at it right away um, to test that would be super convenient for the judges. Uh, having this uh, attached to every filing would be super convenient for the lawyers um, because frankly, it takes away some of the other stuff that you have to do to prove up service, which uh, is oftentimes it's raised more as a dilatory, dilatory move than out of actual sincerity. And so uh, it's not just printing out a copy of the, uh, uh, the confirmation page that you get from eFile Texas. If you've got someone who's really trying to use 
lack of service as a dilatory move, then you're going to have to swear out a declaration that this is a true and correct copy, that it's a business record and do all that stuff. So it's not just a matter of doing that or pulling it up on the phone. If the other side's savvy enough at all in their understanding of the rules of evidence, they can really complicate it on something that uh, is on its face easy to show. Uh, I think this is a great service that eFile Texas is putting together. I think it would help all the users of the court system. Uh, and so, you know, I'm confident that we can, we can figure this out. Um, you know, if it's a one page filing, then yeah, it might double the cost of a certified copy to $2. If it's a 50 page filing, you know, that's a, a 2% increase in certified copy. So, it, you know, it, it, in terms of the raising the cost, it just, it, it depends on the overall size of the filing. Um, but, you know, those are, those are my thoughts on this. And I think uh, this is such a positive uh, tool for all the users that, you know, it's, it's worth working out whatever kinks are there and, and getting it implemented for everyone. If it's any consolation, starting January 1st of 2022, Senate Bill 41 will become effective and electronic copies of electronic documents. Like when it started electronic, um, there's not an extra charge for a second page. It's a dollar up to 10 pages. So if it adds one page, it won't make a difference if the document is less than 10 pages, which is the majority of documents. Well, I think this looks like it is an efficient solution that it helps the public, it helps the clients and, and whatever, but we really do need to focus on making it not costly for the counties that maybe have a system that's having a hard time with it. So Tracy, I hope that you and Evan and, and you all need to work on this and see what we can do to make this a very um, you know, efficient system for you all as well. Um, certainly it's beneficial to the legal system and the lawyers and everything, but let's make it efficient too for all the clerks. So we wanna do that. So I think that's an issue we need to really focus on for for uh, you, Tracy, and any other clerks that seem to have a, um, will have an issue processing these things. And, and just, just to add, add to that, I, we'll, we will monitor things as, as this rollout starts next week um, to make sure that we're not having anything. And then um, the other nice thing, I believe, Evan, too, that if we run into a particular office that's having an issue, we can obviously turn things on and off at the office level if we absolutely have to. But obviously, that's correct. And I would, rather case, not. I would, uh, Casey, be careful with that. And we need to, right. uh, in addition to rolling this out, we also need to, and I know that Blake was working on some language for the lawyers and everyone to understand what this is. Because if you're turning it on and off, make sure that the lawyers and everybody know when you're turning it off and on and whatever, so you won't have... Um, confusion over what's with the document. I mean, we we are um, ignoring Nancy. If we could, yeah, that's that's another thing, Nancy. If you if I see your hand up, you may have to unmute. You're also muted. There you go. There we are. We're also having a similar issue with this newer version. Um, Silverlight, although it was a little clunky, at least it was quick. But the file and serve, it serve 1.0 is really slow. And it, it should not take 10 to 15 seconds to, o to load up an envelope and the document. Um, the auto refresh isn't available in this newer version. So you have to continually click the browser to, to refresh to see if anything's been filed. Um, it's, there are some issues with it. Um, and there's, um, let's see, we, we were told that something was gonna be available. Let's say, reading what uh, my criminal supervisor is telling me is happening. Um, we were told the reviewer would have to option all the information available by default in the upgraded version, but there is no option to set a default. 
Um, and also the name of the clerk isn't showing through when it imports into Odyssey. Thanks, Nancy, for that. Thank you for that feedback. There's, I know there's, there are a couple of features that are currently uh, being uh, delivered, and I think they're coming up in the next few weeks. I'll keep, I'll ask Evan to keep me honest on it. But <clears throat> one of the features is the auto refresh. I know that I think that's either in the next release that we're coming out with or the following. Uh, and then I know that there is another one that um, a couple of courts have have asked about with regards to the page rotation, and that's that's also coming up, I believe, in the next version. Uh, which should be coming out, I think, next week. Um, but Evan can keep me honest with regards to to those. The issues that we're uncovering right now are, are, are good. This is part of the process in, in rolling out a new solution. So identifying those and then being able to resolve them uh, is, is part of the reason why we're asking for clerks to start using this system um, just a little bit at a time so that they can identify those issues and report them so that we can we can resolve them. Um, so uh, it, it, the, the good news is, is we still have the Silverlight version that you can fall back to as a safety net in the interim, but this is part of that iterative development process to make sure that we're getting the solution where it needs to be before that 10, 12 date hit happens with, with Silverlight being deprecated uh, in terms of support by Microsoft. Right. So we appreciate the, the utilization and, and certainly the feedback. This is all helpful and very meaningful to the process. And so Terry or Evan, just so that I'm clear too, that my understanding was is that this is on a very agile kind of, the, the review tools on a very agile framework kind of thing. So there's a new release coming out roughly every, every other week or every week, it's very quick. Um, but that again, the goal was let's get this out there, let's get some clerks using it so that we can identify the issues that y'all y'all been able to bring to the table and get those resolved so that we're not sitting here in mid-October with all of this stuff with no way to go back to Silverlight. Um, I think the biggest concern that, that we have, and I know that Dennis is on the call and could probably echo that, when Microsoft tells us that they're not supporting anything or they're not going to support uh, Silverlight after October the 12th, I wholeheartedly expect on October the 13th for some uh, bad actors to then publish all the security holes that they know about in, in Silverlight, uh, which will then really uh, mean we need to get, get off of that tool. Yeah, Casey, you're right on the, on the release cadence. We're right now we're updating the environment every week. Uh, every other week is introducing new functionality like the page rotation and the auto refresh. The weeks between are actually doing bug fixes that are being reported and, and identified by users of the system. So we're, we're relying on users to use the system to identify those issues and report them to us so that we can resolve them. So uh, I, I know it can be, can be just um, frustrating to use the system and go, man, that doesn't work. And I, I really wish it would. Um, but it's an important part of the process for us to be able to identify it in a real world scenario so that we know whenever we get to that 10, 12, we'll, we'll be in a much better position. So we just want to take a moment and just say thank you for those who are using the system and, and are reporting those issues because it is helpful for us. Okay, um, John, uh, to answer your question, I think you'd ask whether Dallas County had this, the automatic certificate of service enabled and both offices do. Um, um, Evan, as a follow up, is there kind of like a, if, if we listen, if we hear some of the issues that people are having, uh, clerks anyway, uh, is there kind of like a, a baseline, a standard baseline hardware at the local level that, um, that, that Tyler recommends so that there aren't any issues or is it open so it doesn't matter what your platform is, uh, the, the uh, automatic certificate of service will should function? So we have, uh, we have some infrastructure guidelines as far as how fast some of those integration servers should be, you know, RAM, mm -hmm. CPU, OS level. We can, we can yeah. share those details. Actually, I think I think they may actually be out on the evaltexas.gov website. There should be something on there around the integration checklist or, or, or the integration criteria. It does, it does list out our, our recommended 
um, uh, essentially how fast those servers should be. Okay. Um, but as far as like other tools and features on there, not really. There, okay. is, there isn't like a baseline recommendation. Okay. We, we haven't used Silverlight in a while, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so moving on to the next slide. Um, jump the gun a little bit on some of the following insights updates. So I'll reiterate some of those. Um, we, during, during our um, design and analysis phase, we, we actually worked um, collectively with a lot, of, uh, a lot of SMEs from around the state um, in, in different focus groups to show them the tool, get some of their feedback um, around like usability, where they find some of the, some of the um, stats and graphs that are out there um, by default, where they find those valuable. The feedback that we got was overwhelmingly positive. It was intuitive to use. Um, you know, once you actually start clicking around and understand uh, how the tool operates, how to build these reports. Um, again, the pilot program begins in September. Uh, we'll have general production availability in November. And again, we're going to continue uh, delivering a lot of those data enrichments uh, through the cycle one development. Any questions on the e-filing insights uh, in particular? Um, Terry, I, the other thing to keep in mind, or not Terry, sorry, Evan, I saw a thing from Terry pop up. Um, on the e-filing insights, I believe we did gear these so that there is a, a version of like this introductory page that you've got here for clerks that highlights some of the more interesting things that we, that the, our clerk SME subject matter experts have identified of, these are the things that I'm interested in seeing from the e-filing side. And then um, there's a different page that we have set up for those who are more in the court administrator kind of world. Um, for those that want to know things like, you know, what, what kinds of cases are being filed in, in, in my court rather than, uh, you know, clerks are mainly interested in how are we uh, how are we performing as far as you know timeliness of getting things in and how many things are are being uh, approved versus returned for correction those kinds of things. Um, right. I'll just say that it's really interesting. This tool is very interesting, and the data that's flowing into it is is decently close to real time. That's correct. So, um, Evan, is uh, the um, the e-file insights update? That's everything that's coming that we that we should be anticipating going forward. Correct. That's correct. Um, are, are you guys aware of um, uh, House Bill uh, three seven seven four regarding uh, transfers from one county to another or from one clerk to another? House Bill three seven seven four. Yes. It talks about transfers and um, it says the bill requires all transfers to be but to be electronically filed. The bill also requires the use of standardized transfer certificate and index form. The bill requires that this form to be file stamped. The bill prohibits the file stamping of any other documents transferred. And so for us, our business process, it, it's so uh, the documents that we get when, when we ingest those documents that comes electronically and we apply the file stamp, we have to remove the file stamp. Mm -hmm. So that, that's gonna be the end result of what, what the um, what, um, HB 3774 means. So I, would, I think, but it doesn't give a, um, a specific um, Go live date, or should I say, we, with uh, with most bills, they're effective September one. I'm not quite sure if this is going to be a January. It actually requires the clerks, um, the county and district clerks, to actually review how this process works um, as it relates to our, our how our business process works as it relates to the requirements in uh, three seven seven four. So, John, tell me again. There's one thing that hit me. You you mentioned something about. Um, taking off the, the mark on your documents? I, I didn't get that. So what, um, I, what your business process is. Yeah, okay. For, for us, Justice, it says, um, if, it, it, if, if a document is filed as a lead document, e-file Texas automatically place a file stamp uh, placeholder on the top right corner of the document. Uh, the file stamp is uh, officially added 
the file stamp is officially added when the document is accepted. So when we pull it out of the e-file queue, it automatically applies a file stamp. But because it cannot have the file stamp, we have to go and remove the file stamp. That bill where it says that we, we can't file stamp it, the, the only the lead document should be file stamped and none of the um, uh, documents that's, to, or that's, I guess, in that package. So as so was, um, uh, and, and for, for, for my office, in order to meet the requirements of the bill, um, for every document file, the clerk would need to manually delete each of the five separate lines on the electronic line on the electronic file stamp prior to accepting it. The five lines, and this is my, what my manager sent me, the five lines in her experience cannot be deleted at one time. So we got to go and we got to do each one individually. Uh, on all other documents would need to be submitted as an attachment to the uh, to the certificate to the transfer certificate and index form. This will allow the form to be file stamped, but the documents would not be. Okay, so, so I'm gonna express my ignorance and somebody else taught or Mar somebody else may know better what this bill is addressed to. Is this for, John, are, are these things when there is a motion to transfer venue that's granted and you get a whole file in and that yes. file is going to be transferred. And what I assume the bill wants is you not to change the filing dates that are on those underlying documents that have been that's, filed in the other court. Is, is that, that correct? That is correct. Uh -huh. okay. That's correct. Okay, and so your business process then has difficulty not doing that? Is that difficulty? Well, um, but when we when we open the when we open the document, just like with um, if we get if we when we open when we're pulling the document out, well, a pack out of e-file that has multiple documents, those uh, the um, the file stamp is applied to each one, and so and so and with the transfer that won't work because we're only required to do the lead document, not the all not the all doc, all the other documents that would be included. If I, if I may, um, it, from the technical perspective, there's actually a, a couple different ways that we can go mm -hmm. about this. So one, in the new review tool, you do have the ability to, you will have the ability to basically lasso a stamp, be able to delete it or move it in bulk. Um, but there are, there are ways that we can actually prevent that from being stamped altogether. So if I mm -hmm. remember the JCIT standards correctly, there is a filing code called transfer county use only. We have the ability to basically tell the system to say, stamp everything except anything that comes in with a particular filing code or some mm -hmm. particular condition attached to it. So okay. I would suggest a good workaround for to, to support this and remove that pain point altogether would be to um, update your file stamp conditions to say anything that comes across with this, with this code attached to the lead document, do not stamp it. That way you just completely remove the, the, the stamp altogether. Okay. The documents won't get stamped. Okay. And in since, the event. Since, sorry, since, this is, since this is all new, Evan, is there a way you all can put that as a uh, kind of like as part of training and, and title you? Yeah, I can, I can look into that or at the very least we can, okay. we can, if this is some, if the house bills is going to go through, I imagine this won't be the only time we're going to hear about this because mm -hmm. I've set up I set up a lot of counties in, in Texas, and I can tell you a lot of them use kind of a, a default stamping mechanism. And yeah. in the default, it's typically proposed orders that don't get stamped. This may uh -huh. be one of the other things that that we need to add to a yeah. the default stamp is to not stamp anything with this. Yeah. Right. So Evan, I'll just say that I'm sure with the new review tool with e filing insights, when we talk about SB 41 in a minute just add HB 3774 to the list of things that we need to, to continuously message the clerk community about. And I would just point out that that bill, um, so that was a, that, that whole process was a clerk's association proposal um, that made it into the bill. It is, it is signed into law. Um, it's a little bit interesting because the effective date I believe is September 1st of 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, but it requires OCA to adopt a transfer certificate as soon as practical after the effective date, but that has to be included. So it's kind of weird. Um, so I think we're working, I think our staff are working on the transfer certificate with the clerks association now. So okay. I think we should look at that, but I believe it's effective September 1st of 2021. Yeah. It's, um, David, it, it, it's kind of interesting because uh, if it's um, the clerks association, we won't meet until we, until um, October. 
or some, well, or, or maybe the latter part of September, but that's after the um, effective date. So that's going to be kind of uh, interesting. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, any any other questions around either you following insights, updates, or anything we've generally spoken about? Okay. So um, lastly, the here is the proposed timeline for the SB 41 implementation. Um, so we were going to begin sending out the workbooks in mid-September. Um, and whenever we send out the workbooks, it's typically, if you've seen some of the fee workbooks before, they're more consolidated version of the, the master workbook. Um, we'll actually be able to, we'll be holding training webinars uh, for clerks uh, to be able to help them understand how to work or how to update the workbook because um, we will go ahead. I was going to say, Evan, and the one thing that OCA will provide you all will will be providing Tyler is here are the fees. Correct. And the the biggest change with this is that um, there are a lot of there are, there are some fees that are that are chained. Well, I'm trying to figure out how to to say it. In my mind, it's a lot of fees are existing fees are going away and they're being replaced by another fee. And so the here's what the fee is part OCA will be able to provide. And the nice thing is, is it's statewide. It doesn't really, there's a lot less, um, a lot less work for the clerks because it's just here are your fees. You don't get to choose this or that. It's just here are the fees. Mm -hmm. Um, but that there is a lot of uh, mapping and exercise that needs to be done on the CMS side as well. That's correct. And that's that's what makes uh, this fee update implementation, because we've, we've done this in the past multiple times, but it typically consisted of updating the amounts of fees, not necessarily deprecating, new, deprecating old fee schedules and adding new fee schedules, which makes this um, activity wholly unique in what we've done previously in Texas. Um, hence why we're, we're taking such a, a, a strong approach to this and having these webinars and, and really eliciting a lot of, a lot of assistance from the clerks themselves, because we will, we will need help, um, getting this done, uh, in, in, in a timely manner for the January one, uh, updates. So, um, we'll have, uh, several training webinars. They'll be recorded. They'll be provided as well for those clerks and, and those deputy clerks that, um, can't make the actual live webinars. Um, we will take uh, basically the month of October to take the to ingest any workbooks we get back, update the stage environment. That'll leave November for the month of November for uh, clerks and their deputies to go through and validate those changes, make sure they're good. Um, and then, of course, we do add some some additional time in there as well. And then beginning uh, in the middle of December and leading up to the end of December, the end of the year, that's when we start um, prepping our changes for production. And then, of course, the, the evening before January 1st is when we, we make our, our rash of production updates um, in order to make that January 1st deadline. And so to, to build on that, Evan, one of the things, and because we've been talking about this internally at OCA, because obviously we're handing over here what the fees are, but then thinking about technically how this works is going to end up working. Um, we're gonna end up work having to work closely with the clerks and the other CMS vendors as well to make sure that the codes on the CMS side are matching up so that they don't, so that when e-file says, here's the fee I charged that the CMS says, okay, I understand. And let me go market in the CMS with the appropriate fee um, that those need to be changed and in sync at the same time. So I could see where as we start getting the details around the January 1st on what that looks like, that it may, we may be issuing guidance like we really need to think, we really think you should clear your queues on December the 31st, or um, if it's an integration and we need, and the, either the CMS vendor needs time, or if Tyler needs time to go touch configurations and there's like 50 of them, then it may be things like, we need to not allow e-filing for a period of time in order to get that that configuration changed so that we can we can turn it on on January first. That's correct, and we will be we will be sending out um, daily status reports 
to uh, each office on um, what their backlog in the queues looks like. And beginning in December, and I, ideally we'd start to see those uh, get whittled down as we lead up to the, the um, January 1st deadline. Um, again, previously, um, if a filing or an envelope came in before uh, a fee update but was accepted after, they would get the filing that came in that should have the current year's fees get applied with the new year's fees. Um, that same uh, symptom or issue would occur in this instance as well, but it actually may be a little more compounded that some of those fees may be gone altogether, which can create uh, a bit of a, a, a reconciliation challenge on the back end. Right. And that's what we're trying to limit as much as possible. And then the other thing that I, 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 I real, real quick, Casey, because uh, I guess I'm lost. What is a workbook in your eyes? Since I don't think as a clerk, we know what those are. So a, a workbook is um, here are the fees that e-filing is going to charge. And, and then, um, or that Tyler is going to implement. So, so for like Harris County district clerk, here are the, here are the fees based on the state fee schedule. And these are your fees. And then, um, and so then the purpose of that is so that you're aware, because since like in your instance, you control the CMS on the other side so that, that we can give you the ample time to say, okay, on January 1st, the fee schedule I have in place today isn't going to cut it. I need to move to this other fee schedule so that when the EFM says um, this fee is the statewide consolidated case fee, you know, that's a fee that doesn't exist today. Or I don't think it exists today or it may not have that same name because today it's a whole bunch of little fees and all those little fees go away and it's changed into this new big fee so that you know that that's going to happen so that you can deal with it on the CMS side come January 3rd when filings start getting accepted. Um, the other piece that, that we're going to be talking with the clerks to be sure that they're aware is how the money works. Because today, um, the entirety of the, the court fee goes to the county. And then quarterly, the county then turns around to the state and says, okay, this is the state part of the fees that we've collected. Here's, here, state of Texas is your money from the county. Um, on January 1st, when this is implemented, what's gonna end up happening is when the filer pays the, the and I'll, I'm gonna call it the state consolidated fee and the local consolidated fee, those two fees together make up the court fee, then, the state portion is going to go straight to the comptroller and the county portion is going to go straight to the county. Um, but the e-filing system will tell the county, I've, I've charged and collected the state portion so that when you're looking at a, a case and if it was, you know, I'm going to make a, up a fee of, uh, and it's, I'm going to make a round number. It was $500 and 250 went to the state and 250 went to the county so that you know the whole 500 was paid but that 250 had already gone to the state so that you've got your record straight. So as a CMS, we were keeping up with all 500, but you're saying I, in our I, CMS, in order to balance, I'm only going to put in the 250. I'm No, I'm saying the EFM is going to tell you they have paid the 500, but that we, the CMS, have already, or we, the EFM, have already sent the state their 250 of the 500. So you don't need to send that to the state. Well, our books won't balance if we put in the whole 500. And that's, in that case, then put in the 250 when you see that come through. Because there, we know that there are some counties that keep up with the whole amount and others that only keep up with what they care about. And so we want to make sure that the entire amount is there so that each CMS vendor can decide, do I want to keep track of everything or do I, what do I want to keep track of? Well, the, what's, I guess my question would be, Tyler is going to deposit what into our bank account? If it's going to be um, the 250, gonna... then we've got to just account for the 250, right? Right. So, exactly. So there'll be and David can correct me if I'm wrong on the title, but I think it's like the local consolidated court fee. There's a name for it and there's a set amount for, and it's based on case types that Harris County is gonna get X number of dollars for this case type for a new case. And here's that amount. And then there you go. And that amount gets transferred to Harris County. The EFM will tell you the state also collected the state 
fee and that's already gone to the state and it's up to you as the CMS provider to decide, do I want to keep track of that or do I not? Um, the ones we've seen that, that tend to want to keep track of it are um, the ones that, that know. And so just to be aware that if you have a pro se come over the counter and file a case, then the county's collecting both the state and the county fee and that the state's going to want its money on the quarterly report like it always does. Right. And we would be assessing those fees, but right. we wouldn't assess anything that we're not going to get. Yeah, so. that's fine. And that the FM will allow that. I have a question. Go ahead, Judge. All right. So uh, it's dangerous when I come in with a, a minutia type question on something like this that's really you know behind the scenes but is this going to create problems for clerks accounting for co co court costs when they have to issue their their cost bills at the end of a case when you enter judgment or when they tabulate uh, the the abstract of judgment if if we've got some that are only, keeping track of the 250 that uh, the county deposits in its account as opposed to others that keep track of what the original fees were that were filed by the plaintiff if they're gonna get their car costs at the end of the day? I mean- Judge, you asked my question, thank <clears throat> you. I mean, I think that- I Reminds think, think alike, John. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer to that is that it, it could if the clerk it's not um, paying attention, which is one of the reasons why we pass that information on. The fact is that there is now one state civil filing fee and one local civil filing fee. So if the case is filed on or after January 1st of 2022, the clerk should just assume because it's, it, well, I mean, we pass along to them that, this, that the uh, filer paid the state filing fee and the local filing fee. Uh, there's only two fees now. There's not 122 or whatever there were before. There are two. They're going to get the local fee. The state, if it's paid through e-filing, the state fee will be transferred directly to the state rather than going to the county and then to the state. And so um, as far as their bill of cost, they will have to account for that state civil filing fee um, because it was paid. Well, okay. So it sounds like... I don't know if it's not, I, don't, I can't tell if, if it's been thought through, but for the clerk's ministerial duty of tabulating the court costs after judgment, uh, when those court costs are taxed against uh, a non prevailing party or in favor of a prevailing party, the clerk's still going to need to be able to, uh, or is still going to need to account for both those fees, unless you're telling me that the uh, state's share of the fee has been exempted from the taxation of costs. No, it has not. The clerk, okay, will, still so, have to, the clerk will still have to account for that. So we, it, it, it strikes me that maybe we need to, and again, like I said, it's dangerous when I start getting into the minutia on this, think through something like that. And then another part, this is showing my ignorance. Um, are, are you saying that they, well, let me ask, do you still have to pay a separate jury fee? Or if the is this not. bill taken care of, so you do not. The jury fee is repealed. It is a part of the part of the consolidated fee now. Okay, so I every, guess every every case will pay a jury fee as part of the filing fee. They will have covered their jury fee. There's no what separate. If a, jury what fee. if a party doesn't want a, a jury? That's fine. It's just part of the filing fee now. It's not a. It's not. There's not a separate fee for a jury fee anymore. It's just a part of the filing fee. A portion of the no. of the local consolidated filing fee is direct. The counties are directed to put that into a jury fund to cover all jury costs. Period. Okay. All right. I'm no, just thinking no. now in terms of lawyer. Uh, I don't have to worry. Did I pay my jury fee? I may have my jury demand in there, but I don't have to worry about. Did the other side pay the jury fee, or I need to go pay that? You're saying it's it's part of the original filing fee. That's correct. Interesting. Okay. There are right. no separate filing fees left in a civil case. There are a few in a family law case, like a transfer fee and things like that, but there are no separate civil filing fees other than the state consolidated civil filing fee 
and the local civil filing fee. There are service fees. So like if you request a citation or something like that, you still have to pay extra for that. And those are, those are now also um, uniform between the county and district clerks. So there's one, basically, no matter where you file the case anymore, it's going to be the same amount. But as far as filing fees, there, is, there, are, there are no, you know, some counties had the law library fee and some counties had an ADR fee and some counties had, so there were like, you know, hundreds of fees that had been, and now those are all repealed. And they're all, there's only one now. There's, it's all included in that one local consolidated filing fee and state consolidated filing fee. And then on the back side, the state and the county are then directed to distribute certain amount, percentage of that consolidated fee into those funds that were previously being funded by the hundred different filing fees. Okay. I cannot congratulate whoever pushed that through. Uh, Absolutely. Enough. As far as trying to Thank you very much. what your filing fees are from county to county, from court to court. I mean, this is a huge step forward. So thank you, whoever was involved in that. And I think that's just really going to make things easier for the public and for the lawyers and their clients. And the David, how many sessions has that been kicking around? Um, many. We have now done that with criminal and civil. So, and let me just, let me just clarify that it applies at the JP courts, the county courts, the district courts. So basically if you file a case, if you file a civil case Excellent. in a district court, constitutional county court, statutory county court, um, those fees are the same. There is one fee. It's $350 is the total fee for a civil case in any of those, including family in any of those courts. If you file a subsequent action, I'm, I'm going to get this number wrong, but I think it's $80. Um, so like a counterclaim, cross-claim, intervention, every county, every court, it's the same. If you file in a justice court, the amount is something like uh, $57. I'll get it wrong again, but it's it's one fee, um, no, no matter which county you're in. Um, and then if you're in the statutory probate court, or sorry, if you file a probate mental health or guardianship case, it doesn't matter which court you're in, doesn't matter which county you're in, the fee is the same everywhere. That's for after 1-1 one, one of 22? One one twenty two. And that would include fees that are sent to the appellate courts. That is correct. As part of the, as you know, Chief Justice Quinn, some of the appellate courts had a separate five dollar um, filing fee that was being sent to them. That fee is abolished. It's now part of the consolidated filing fee, and on the back side, that money still flows to the appellate courts. From a from a clerk's perspective, this it's it is good because we we would get complaints from or lawyers who always say, well, why if I go to this side of the counter to file a um, a family action, it's this or 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 should I say if I file a um, a a civil case in the district courts, there's this fee, and if I file that exact same case in the county courts, it's a separate fee. There, there's a lot of cleanup, and while the, it, it's going to be just kind of difficult only at, on the front end while we're getting ready to implement it, but once um, once once we have implemented the um, for our, our, our for us and for our county auditors, uh, this will this will be um, a a, re a reduction in time, or or it will alleviate a lot of time spent trying to separate which fee goes into which category into which bucket. Do you know, David, if that also applies to uh, post trial stuff like motion for a new trial? No, no additional fee for that, or no, that's correct. It's a part of the that is now a part of the. Um, subsequent filing fee so it's there is still a fee but it's um it's not um there's not a, a bunch of separate little fees it's basically there's one 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 original and one subsequent there's about a so, hundred repealers in that bill um so so yes that's all great that it's all consolidated now but I think we've created an auditing nightmare for us if those fees are going to go directly to the state, but somehow we have to track it on the CMS that we don't currently have today in order for a judgment that's rendered with a cost bill to be paid by the other side. Uh, it, it becomes then the clerk to have to go back and look at see it, what all got paid in order to add that into the cost bill, correct? So that, that's what we we're talking about, the EFM passing that information along so that the CMS could consume mm -hmm. that and know that that it, the state consolidated fee has 
has been charged and then has been separately collected so that the CMS knows, hey, this fee is there. And then that that's why we, we're going to have to work with the CMS vendors to let them know about these changes so that they can make sure that their customers are ready for this because it, it is a departure from what they've normally done. And I think... Right. So, um, so, how is, so I take it there's going to be a ton of XML changes in order I, to show that? I don't know that there'll be a, a ton, but I imagine there, there's got to be something. And I'll, I'll let Terry or Evan um, talk to that. Yeah, I, I think I think that we still we're still working through some of the details. I think there are some procedural nuances that we'll have to also then figure out how do we handle it. So an example would be like a refund if a refund was issued or even a, a judge, <clears throat> excuse me, a judge waiving the fees after they're filed. And those fees have already been distributed to the state and to the local entity. Just kind of the pr processes on how we would handle those types of scenarios and situations. It's just stuff that we'll have to work through during this process to try to identify what the right approach is in a way that can work in the most efficient way for, for everyone. There's a lot of uh, players involved because of the different CMS providers, the homegrown solutions, as well as the, the money that we're depositing into the states. We just need to make sure that all of the parties and stakeholders are aligned as we're working through some of these, some of these unique scenarios. I think <clears throat> the first part is identifying the way that it should work and the I guess you want to call it the happy path or the gold case, the, the way that it normally would work in the general um, use use cases. And then as we get that solidified, then I think it's starting to pivot to some of those more unique scenarios that don't happen as frequently. And that, and you say and you're saying that's going to be available for us to look at of what that change is by September the 20th. I'm saying we're we're working through those details right now. I don't have that information right. Now. So we think that that may be based on the graphic on the screen. Tyler will start making updates to stage in, in early October. And will all of this information be in these workbooks? Yes. Uh, yeah, you would know these are the these are the new fees. And actually, it would be here are the fees that you're going to get rid of, and here are the new fees that are going to replace those fees. So but you can see based on on what David had said. And I agree that there's a lot of fees that are going to just flat out disappear and they will be replaced by these two other fees. And then again, with the additional services, there'll be a lot of different fees that are going to change there as well to where in the past it was configurable at the county level because some may have done because of the way the fees were previously worded with, you know, that up to two dollars or up to language. All that's gone away and it's now, you know, just a here's the fee. And so, I, I, I'm assuming the records archive and for the counties will still have those fees for the local level. Those, I believe those are all wrapped into the local consolidated fee. So in the bill, it says of that local consolidated fee, this percentage out to some ungodly right. number of decimals needs to go to the archive fee. This goes to the XYZ fee at the county, those kinds of things. Gotcha. But but you're saying stage is going to be updated October 6th or it's all the way through to the end of October to where CMS is, is only going to have two months to get everything done on their side? Terry, Evan, you want to take that one? Yeah, so uh, typically the way it's worked in the past, it's it's first in, first out, honestly. So as you begin to pass the workbooks back, it goes, it goes to the implementation specialist that's in charge of handling the updates for that particular that particular uh, assignment. And then as soon as it's done, a notification sent back out like, hey, you're, you're good to test and save. So if you get, if the workbook you get on the 14th, you get it back or September 14th, you get it back on September 18th. Well, it'll probably be turned around in stage even before October. But I, I think what we're saying is that's that's where if if within this time frame between September 13th and October 5th, Whatever we collect, that's what we're going ahead and starting to work on in stage. But again, if you get it in early, it gets to stage early. I'm talking about for the XML changes that the CMSs are going to have to do. Oh, and are, are they going to have any XML changes or was that fee get presented in the, the state fee get presented in the existing XML, which it very well might. Yeah. And again, like, like Terry said, that's something we're, we're still working through to see if there is an update, when is it going to be, when is it going to be put out there? And if there is an update, I'm, I'm sure it'll be um, sooner rather than later to give CMSs 
plenty of time. Evan, will these workbooks be ready by the 7th? Because the clerks are meeting the 8th through eighth through the 10th in, uh, in Round Rock. And it would be great if we could discuss these workbooks. We've got a time frame for legislative updates and a transfer bill review. And that might be a perfect time to throw in a little bit of this workbook discussion because you're it appears that you're going to be sending those out, you know, mid-September for the webinars starting September 20th through the through October 1st, if I understand correctly. Correct. So full disclosure, what when we say workbook, what we, we mean is if you if you're familiar with the previous implementations, particularly the civil one, um, it, the workbook was essentially an Excel file that had that was tabulated that showed you a flat view of the relationships that we build within the system. So it's essentially a, a narrowed focus of that strictly driven on um, here are the fees we pulled that you currently use and here are the relationships you have based on those fees, whether it be case type, filing code or optional service. And then from there you would guide us on, okay, these fees are gone, it needs to be replaced by these fees. And what we do is take that and say, okay, these are the relationships we need to go update. So on that note, I can check with our, our implementation folks that are, are running point on this and see if we could get either some representation or at least a, a sample workbook um, for you guys to look at during that time. Cause I think that's actually an excellent idea. Um, maybe that's a good time for us to get any kind of feedback too. So that when we do start these training webinars, everybody's sort of on the same page of what they expect to see within these webinars. Yeah, I think it'd be great. We've got over 400 people registered, I believe. What did you say those dates were again? Um, we are actually meeting September 8th through the 10th and the legislative updates are going to be on September 8th from 3.30 to 4.30. And then we've got a transfer bill review, which is from 4.30 to 5. So it would probably behoove all of us if we could get you guys in there and share a little bit of time with our legislative updates. I, I believe, Laura, that there will be an extensive discussion of Senate Bill 41 during that time. Um, I mean, I don't know if the workbooks have to be done. We've obviously got to be a lot of education about this. Um, and so maybe we can work together. I don't know if uh, Patty Henry is planning on presenting that. I think so. But anyway, yeah. we can talk about it and make sure and see what we can get available. Maybe talk with Tyler about what um, what might be available by then. But certainly Senate Bill 41 will be on the discussion. Yeah, I know it is, David. Thank you. Yeah, Laura, we'd be happy to help however we can. If we can't get all the workbooks produced and delivered out by then, and we can at least at the very minimum, <clears throat> excuse me, come with an example that we can then speak through because a lot of it is going to be fairly consistent. I think the nuances will be between integrated courts versus non-integrated courts. And so we'll have an easier time for those non-integrated courts because there is no relationship with their, their case management system. It really is the state fees that we're applying. So I think we can talk to those two flavors uh, of implementations at, at that conference if it's appropriate. Happy to help out. Thank you. All right, Evan, keep on it, trucking. That actually brings us uh, to the end of the presentation for, for the Tyler folks. Um, hey, Evan, I, I, Casey, I did want to share one thing. There was a request that came out of the last JCIT meeting, and I'm sorry, but I failed to get it into the presentation, but I do want to share some statistics that were requested on behalf of the research document purchase um, solution. And um, so, so looking at that, we're pulling the numbers in. One of the requests was is how much document purchase transactions have been recovered through research. And right now that number is 307,744. <clears throat> the request was also to see if we could break that up by, between integrated courts and non-integrated courts. We weren't tracking that all the way back since we started. So at the time that we did start tracking that, we do have <clears throat> the breakout between integrated and non-integrated courts. So there is still an unknown amount out there um, that we can go back in and, and see if we can try to figure out where it goes. But that breakout is integrated is about uh, 57,984. The non-integrated was 138,686. 
and then that unknown quantity before we began tracking the integrated and non-integrated uh, aspect of it was $111,074. I think the, um, the, 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 one of the things that I think is important here is when you look at the, um, the number of courts that are integrated, because those numbers actually show that the, the non-integrated are, are capturing more, but there's only 18 counties uh, in, in 39 offices within those 18 counties that are currently integrated with Research uh, Texas today. So <clears throat> just pulling from those uh, sets of, of courts and, and that's the volume that you're getting there. So apologize for not having it in the deck, but happy to update the deck and then uh, include that information for when Casey shares it at, after the meeting. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Terry. Any other questions uh, for Tyler? All right, hearing none. Uh, the next item that we do have on the agenda is a quick, and it'll be quick, uh, update on OCA's uniform case management system project. Uh, you guys um, may recall that OCA uh, put out an RFO earlier in the year um, for case management system for counties less than 20,000 population. Um, we were hoping that we would be done by the procurement cycle by now and could tell you stuff. Uh, but unfortunately, um, we missed it by roughly a week, I think. And so um, hopefully next week, we'll send out an announcement to you all to, to tell you more about this project and uh, the direction that we're going in. Um, so that's the update that we have on that. Um, next on the agenda, we've got our two subcommittees, the Cybersecurity Committee, and Judge Hind, I'll let you give a quick update, but I, I believe we met one time since our last meeting uh, and had a fruitful discussion. Yeah, that's my memory and my notes. Uh, if you met with the others, uh, you know, maybe, maybe I should take the hint that I'm not needed, but anyway, uh, you yeah, uh, know, after our last full JCIT meeting, uh, the uh, JCIT gave us our charge. So we had a follow-up um, uh, with some committee action. Uh, one was the committee should identify activities that judges, clerks, and court administrators can do with very little or no involvement from county or city IT to instill a culture of good cybersecurity. And the committee should identify questions that judges, clerks, and court administrators should ask their county uh, or city IT to make sure their cybersecurity needs are met. So we did have, we had a lot of um, offline discussion with emails, with ideas, and, you know, uh, frankly, Dennis is both an invaluable contributor on this, and he scares the heck out of me every time I get an email uh, from him because it's something more terrible out in the cybersecurity world, but frankly, that's the, we need to know the threats out there. And so I'm, I'm, I, I say that jokingly, but I'm glad to see him every time he sends it because it helps uh, helps us with our cybersecurity subcommittee, uh, but also it helps me warn my IT guy uh, about things that he needs to be looking out for. Uh, but we did have a nice frugal discussion, um, you know, kind of top level. I, we don't have a formal recommendation yet, but I think uh, we're getting close. Uh, but concepts, uh, there were a couple things uh, we thought about in terms of reaching out to the Texas Center for the Judiciary. Uh, at first, we were thinking, well, maybe we can get some time on one of their conferences to make a presentation. But then, you know, one of the things that we started to realize as we're talking about just cybersecurity training is that it, it needs to be repetitive. Uh, I get, my firm subscribes to some cybersecurity training and stuff, and it's something where, you know, I do a 20-minute training session once a month or something like that. You need to kind of constantly ping users to remind them and to elevate their sophistication. And so one idea we thought, we haven't reached out to, well, I don't know, maybe Casey we have, but uh, the idea was to reach out to TCJ to suggest that um, they consider rolling some slides or some video about cybersecurity between their ed sessions at all their conferences. And doesn't have to be between every session, but it's something 
you know, usually they got music playing. The hotel plays some elevator music or something like that in, in between um, presentations. Maybe have something like this, something rolling through their slideshow so that maybe the judges aren't paying, you know, precise attention, as much atten attention as they play uh, during the actual presentations, but they'll start seeing some things. And maybe it's some scary stuff about cybersecurity uh, um, uh, you know, infiltrations, or maybe it's, it's kind of, it, maybe it's the Southwest Airlines uh, commercial where the person, you know, clicked on the wrong link and all of a sudden everybody's computers in their, uh, in their cubicles start going crazy and they say, want to get away, you know? So, you know, some thoughts about that. And similarly to uh, the, the, the clerks association, which I think John said, actually the clerks association has been doing some, um, presentations about cybersecurity. Uh, it's important to include the judges on this in, in two aspects because one is their users, and um, most of them don't come from, um, we'll say, the type of organizational or educational background that has, uh, you know, advanced level sophistication in IT. We'll just put it that way, and. So, and at the same time, because they're elected officials and they're part of a separate branch of government, a lot of times staff and so forth defer to the judge and might cut them some slack that they wouldn't cut other people uh, in, in the organization in terms of cybersecurity. I mean, changing passwords and stuff like that. And so, you know, the idea is getting messages directly to the judges in some sort of way, repeated way, uh, might be a way that we could do this, uh, start developing some understanding uh, of what they should do uh, to try and both protect themselves but protect their organizations. But the second component of that, at least with the district judges, is the district judges appoint the county auditor in every county. And so the thought is we start uh, working on uh, talking to the district judges about when you are appointing the county auditor, what are you in the scope of work? What are you putting in there in terms of auditing for cybersecurity? Uh, is is the auditor auditor doing that? Is they not? Are they not? Is that something that you know we should start counseling district judges that perhaps you do uh, that at least in terms of situations where the county provides the IT services to the to the district court. So there's a, a special linkage there. Um, on top of that, you know, uh, on types of what kind of questions, what can you do? Obviously, there's a training. Uh, I get um, our, our firm subscribes, as I said, to a service where uh, the, the provider sends dummy phishing emails to us. Uh, and it's a it's a training exercise eh, for us to start to learn to recognize uh, questionable emails so that we don't fall for it. But it also helps our IT folks identify the people who probably need a little bit more training uh, and uh, might in fact be um, weak points in our cybersecurity uh, fortress. Uh, and so, you know, are those things that you know, the courts might want to look into. We still need to flesh out how do you do that? Do you leave it up to each court to, to do that? Do we offer that as a service through, uh, through the regional presiding judges, through the OCA? I don't know. Um, but uh, there's also, um, you know, some questions that we, we would hope the clerks and the courts would be asking to the extent that they're dealing with their own IT folks, as well as if they're beholden to IT with the county uh, or, uh, and so forth. And so, you know, we're, we're developing a set of questions that, you know, we want to educate them on, here's why this is important. Here's why you should ask it. And you should press for real answers. And so, for example, uh, what is, uh, do you have a recovery time objective if you have a, um, uh, I forget what we call it, but uh, uh, whether it's the ransomware attack that we had last year or a couple of years ago when the Supreme Court's website went down because there was a power outage and so forth, 
when you have disaster recovery, what is your time objective and what is your recovery point objective? Uh, you know, how far back uh, do you want to be able to go? Like the hour before, or are you comfortable with, it? you can only recover back to about two or three days ago or something like that. But to start getting people to think about these types of things while they're in a position where they can plan for it rather than trying to scramble as you're racing into the office as the servers are getting encrypted and so forth. Uh, what, is the dis what is the disaster recovery plan? You, you need to ask that. And, and if there isn't an answer, uh, that's an important data point that you need to follow up on. Um, you know, start talking to the judges about what are you going to do when the system is down? Uh, I think our courts of appeals and Supreme Court and the Court of Criminal Appeals have some pretty fresh um, experience with, with figuring this out. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a, a data issue a couple of years ago in Harris County. Uh, and so we had to figure out on the fly, frankly, the, the judges, the clerk's office was working real, real hard to, to get it fixed and everything, but we had to figure out what are we going to do? Uh, how long is it going to be? You know, if it's, if it's a day or two, that might be one thing, but what, what if you're going to be out for a couple of weeks? Uh, are you going to still do hearings? How are you going to do hearings? How are you going to have access to files? You need to think about what you're going to do. How will they operate? Um, start encouraging courts, not just the clerks, but the courts themselves to develop their own disaster response plan. You'd want to coordinate with the other government groups that you work on or are dependent on, but you need to have some sort of response plan. Uh, you know, at the very least, every court should have a phone tree for the court staff, <laughs> you know, if, uh, if something's going on. I mean, most organizations have something like that so that if there's, you know, hey, the power's out in the, in the office, you can't come in today you know, you get the message out quickly. Uh, but how do you get the message out to the public? And uh, who is going to be the spokesperson for your situation? You know, uh, courts and, cl and clerks oftentimes work together, but, you know, uh, are you going to let the clerk be your spokesperson or are you going to have separate uh media availability or spokesperson for the court itself when you in like in Harris County where we've got you know uh, 60 district judges plus 20 more county court level judges you know um, it, it's useful for consistency of message but also to take some of the pressure off people if you have one or two point persons if you have a policy for who's going to be the one writing the press releases, who's going to be writing the, if you use Twitter, the Twitter announcement, who's going to be the one doing the social media and so forth, who's going to be the one that uh, can be interviewed by, uh, by the local TV to get out the message, for instance. Well, if you have a jury summons, it's canceled for the next three weeks because uh, our computers are down and we're not going to be able to check you in or we're not going to be able to try any cases or something like that. Who's going to be the one person so that you have a consistent message. So a lot of this is encouraging folks to, to plan ahead when they've got the time and when they're not under the stress of an event to think things through. And so we need to start uh, working on a plan for getting that message out to, uh, to the courts, to the clerks. And as I said, one of the ideas is to see if we can get regular messages through the judicial conference. We won't get all the judges all the time, but we'll start building uh, a, a good, um, you know, a good core of judges who are thinking about this. We'll get all the regional judges because they, all of them go to these conferences and, you know, that will help with the trickle down of getting messages to folks. And so that's kind of where we're at. We still, we still have some work to do before we've got anything formal to present to JCIT. Uh, but we're brainstorming, we're, we're coming up with ideas and, you know, we've got some, some things to go. And, you know, I'm sure uh, with the next threat, we'll, we'll get some sort of scary message from Dennis and we'll have to more to think about, about how, how vulnerable we are. I think uh, I love Dennis and so I'm not picking on him or anything. Uh, the, I think he made the, the, the best piece of advice that we need to give folks is 
it's going to happen to you. You have to just be prepared. I mean, do your best to prevent this and, and avoid all that stuff. But, you know, it's going to happen. So you need to plan for when it happens. So anyway, I think I quoted you or I paraphrased you correctly, Dennis. Uh, if I didn't, please correct me. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah. And thanks to your committee. And I just want to encourage you, Dan, if to, and I bet you've already done this, but I was going to say to reach out to the Texas Center for the Judiciary because I know they also do programs and things and you, I think there would be great synergy between you guys, um, you and Dennis and, and the, your, your group to get with that center for judiciary and see, you know, about an article maybe, or even, you know what I mean? To work with them as well, because I know they're always trying to educate the, the judges. So that's, those are all great ideas. And we look forward to seeing um, uh, your uh, more of your information from your committee. Thank you. So I was going to turn to Carlos and Todd. I'm trying to remember who's on the committees on the orders. We saw that most lawyers are constantly asking for orders. Um, it looks like when I, it looks like for the integrated systems that that's an easier process than others. It looks like although there aren't orders in research, there are a numerous, um, you know, counties and courts that are publishing their orders or providing their orders either through subscription. I mean, at one time, some were free. So there's just a huge variety out there on orders. Uh, and uh, so I don't know, Carlos, if your committee is ready to kind of report out more or where you are on, on that. Judge, thanks. And uh, maybe Todd has, has more to say on this, but I, I think at this point, we don't have uh, anything more to report? We had the survey, I think, that we've been working on with Casey um, and um, still need to, to meet and then we'll have a full report next time. Todd, is there anything that, that you're aware of or that we've got to report for this meeting? No, I think that covers it and it, it's accurate. Okay, so we look forward to your report then. And then I want to uh, recognize Mark Unger, if you're still here, Mark. Yes, okay, there. I know you were um, interested and had a survey and have maybe a little update for us um, and uh, uh, on Bear County and what you're experiencing down there. Uh, I, don't, I don't really have anything prepared, uh, but I did a survey uh, six years ago um, and largely replicated it a, a few weeks ago. Uh, we had 160 responses six years ago. We had about 38 or 40 uh, so far in the last week or two. Um, and the answers are, are sort of uh, all over. Uh, well, there's some trends that are noticeable, but I'm, I'm not prepared to really go into the details okay. of it. But there's, uh, in essence, um, we're having a, a tremendous difficulty getting documents um, produced and the, the process, which I think ought to be able to be uh, made relatively seamless with digital signatures by judges and uh, requests uh, for searchable orders is is uh, is not the case currently. If orders are being printed out, rescanned, unsearchable, takes uh, anywhere from mostly 14 to 30 days to get uh, to get an order. Signed order, uh, with some exceptions. I mean, there's some judges are are uh, emailing them uh, right away. Uh, we have a presiding system, of course, and so all those orders are getting printed and uh, and then uh, wet signatures applied uh, and then they go into a clerk's queue for any number of uh, days or weeks. Okay. I don't know if there's anybody here from Bear County that w that uh, is on the line that could uh, add anything from their perspective. So Judge Canales, do you... Um... I know that there's been the transition to Odyssey and Terry can probably speak to that as well. So I know Bear County has been transitioning to the Odyssey program. So I know there's been um, situations there. Um, have you experienced a delay, Judge uh, Canales, in uh, getting those uh, getting orders to the attorneys? Not that that's your role, but I mean, in terms of just at the courthouse. I think I probably echo what Mark's concerns are, at least uh, from what I hear from from other uh, other lawyers, I will say my personal experiences, I do try to email copies of whatever I sign and send out in terms of orders to the lawyers on a case. 
Uh, I've been doing that for, for a while anyway, uh, ever since, uh, I guess when the, we, we went virtual so that because it's as simple as me again, just sign it in order. Um, if I sign it virtually, uh, electronically, then I can just distribute it to whoever's on, on file. But to say that there's a simplified or a streamlined or seamless process, otherwise, other than that, um, like Mark said, there's, there's just some tremendous um, hiccups in that happening. So I can say, and I again, just speak for myself, but I imagine this is the process all the way around. My clerk prints out every order I sign, even if it's electronically signed, or if I just drop my signature through Adobe and then scans it in because that's the process that she's instructed to use right now. So uh, just like Mark said, every order really is getting printed out and then scanned into the file. It's not uh, something where if I did, and I'm not, I, there's only a few orders. I, I can probably count on my, on my hand, on one hand, how many orders I have digitally signed through like Adobe sign, which is to say a click and then it gets sent to someone and routed and done that way. Everything I sign, I insert basically as a pre-uploaded signature on it and I save it as a PDF and then send it that way. So we're encountering some, some problems and difficulties here. Harry, who's working on the Odyssey situation down in Bear County? I cannot imagine why they have to consume orders through a scan, a print and scan situation. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's our case management side of the, the business that's that's implementing that. I know one of the things that we've been working uh, to try to push uh, Bear County to do is integrate with research. If they if that integration with research happens, then when the judges are signing those orders and uploading them into Odyssey, then that'll automatically then go out into research and then be made available. And that's that's the ideal scenario is <clears throat> the electronic signatures and routing of those um, proposed orders or judgments get to the judge electronically, and then they're able to then review them. And if they need to make mass edits, they can. But generally, if they're just making a few strike throughs and maybe a few markups and then signing it, then it can get converted into an order and then it would automatically be delivered out into research and made available to authorized users. And so that's a big part of, of the integration with research. It's the feedback that we continue to hear, which is when are we going to get judgments and orders? This is exactly uh, a, a good a good data point there. This is, this is pretty common um, a, a, across the board. But I, one of the things that I, I can't speak to, but I, I'll, I'll dig in with our, our team is <clears throat> the routing of uh, getting those proposed orders to the judge and how that's being handled on the internal process before we get to the execution and then outbound uh, availability because there could be some nuances there that 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 can be made more efficient. Yeah, it sounds like a business process problem more than it does a technical problem, which is really a shame. Um, judge Canales, did you have a question or comment? Just really fast to elaborate on that is just because he mentioned something that also I've noticed is. Um, I, I'm, I don't know how it is anywhere else, but here it's rare. Um, I, I will once in a while draft my own orders, but that's not common here. And so one of the problems I've encountered even when I sign in is editing orders. Uh, most of the time it says someone else has determined what you can do and what you can't with this order. And so I'm not able to do that. And so I found a workaround around it, but uh, it's cumbersome, which is I save it as its own PDF and then I make edits on it. And then I, again, either print and send it to my clerk to print it out for me to physically sign it or I'll drop in the signature. So again, there's, the, the, I don't know how it is anywhere else, but here what I've encountered, and I don't know that's uh, how much that's a Tyler issue, if you will, but, but it is, there's, there's just, it's, 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 there's a lot, a lot of steps involved sometimes in me just entering a simple order. And so I just thought I'd point that out. Yeah. Hey judge, I'll, uh, I'm going to put my email address <clears throat> Excuse me, in the comments or in the chat box. If you would, would mind just shooting me a note, shooting me an email, and what I'll do is we'll, we'll have the appropriate team members reach out to you and then we'll start trying to work through it. I appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. And Judge Canales, I, I'm going to look to you as a point person. You know, Mark and I sat in a, um, a presentation on uh, the Odyssey system and on the new filing system and transition where there was described uh, weeks of delay on orders, which I can't imagine in certain circumstances. I, you know, 
by the time the attorney gets it, you could have appellate timelines that have passed. I, I just don't um, uh, understand quite why that business process is that way. So I encourage you and Terry to work together and kind of, I think it needs a top-down approach a little bit, Judge Canales, in terms of really getting uh, more efficiency in the system over there to benefit you know, everybody at the courthouse. Um, absolutely. I was going to say absolutely, Justice. I'd be glad to do anything I can okay. to help streamline this process. All right. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. All right, does anybody else have any um, uh, business or anything, any remarks, comments that they would like to make? This is Bob. I would like to take this opportunity to thank David oh, yes. for all his support and encouragement both as a member of JCIT and as the director of the All Support Administration. Um, look forward to working with you in your new role, but I just wanted to say thanks. And I absolutely concur. I think I have had a subconscious denial, David, that you're leaving. So <laughs> please forgive me for not for not saying uh, at the very beginning of this, how much we have appreciated all your tremendous work, both on the committee and then on the court and with you know leading the role with OCA, um, you have just really improved the justice system in Texas. And that's something you can be very proud of. And I know I'm very proud to have, having been able to work with you and look forward to working with you in your future endeavors. So, um, Bon voyage, congratulations, and don't forget about us. Um, and we'll, we are going to forget about you. you. We may find you wherever you are. So thanks a bunch. And, and Judge, I'll just mention, I already know his new email address. So oh, if, we need to, if we need to find him, we know where to get him. Excellent. <laughs> and we All also right. know that most people never change their cell phone numbers. So I could probably still call him too. That's excellent. Okay, so with that, I want to go ahead. If there's nothing further, we're going to go ahead and adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for participating by Zoom. And until we see each other again in person, um, stay healthy and, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your time and efforts. Thank you.